Okay, so in last lesson we were talking about the people and, and the land um, and just kind of introducing that. And I was talking about Egypt and um, I kind of drew a blank there. I was talking about the old kingdom and the middle kingdom and the new kingdom um, of Egypt. And um, I just kind of wanted to clarify some things. First off, what I was talking about was called the, uh, the um, intermediate period. Um, after the Old Kingdom, which was a period of time where Egypt was unified, North and, North and South Egypt was unified, there was an intermediate period, okay? And during this, there was, you know, chaos and stuff. And then in the Middle Kingdom, once again, unification, another uh, intermediate period, and then the New Kingdom. Um, and so, so that's what I was talking about. The, the, the kingdoms have to do with a span of time, and in between those were intermediate periods where they didn't have that. So um, I, I hope that clarified that. I, I uh, can't believe I uh, blinked on that. So in, today, in, in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about prehistory and uh, as, as it relates to Genesis and, and Job. Um, prehistory being everything before recorded events happened. I mean, even the events of Genesis were written down after after the fact. Um, so, you know, it's important to remember that the Genesis records things that happened prehistory, before history actually happened. Um, oops. There we go. Okay. So, uh, when we're studying the Old Testament, it's important to note that the Old Testament is unique, but it is not the first. Um, there have been, you know, uh, other. There are other accounts of a flood. There are other accounts of, you know, um, this and that happening. There are other accounts of, you know, uh, the gods' interactions, gods plural, with, and interactions with man, humanity. There's there's myths as to as to man reaching the heavens and that kind of stuff. I mean, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of ancient Near Eastern um, stories and whatnot that, that we can compare to the Old Testament. The Bible is not the first, you know. There were law codes before Leviticus was ever given. Um, some people, you know, they, they, they seem to think that the only way that the Bible could be true or noteworthy is if it was the first. And, you know, I, I, I think that maybe that's pushing something on the Bible that really isn't, first off, isn't that big of a deal. And second off, it shouldn't matter to us, um, us being Christians. Um, so yes, it is. It is unique in the sense that there is there is definitely no ancient literature that's that's like it, um, but definitely not the first. Um, and one thing that we see in throughout the Old Testament is it con contrasts strongly with pagan beliefs. Um, I mean, it, if you get familiar with with texts from the ancient Near East, it, it's almost um, it's almost funny how the accounts in the Old Testament are almost making fun of it at, at, of them at times. Um, it, it's very much so strongly contrasts. Um, in one area that it contrasts is the plurality of gods. Um, in other, in, in in the myth accounts, you know, there's always a bunch of gods and like they're having like fights with each other and, and you know there's all kinds of these different reasons for stuff. But in the Bible we don't see that. Genesis one one through two says, "In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth." The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So already at the start we have, you know, God, there's only one God, and he's doing all these things. Um, which I think that it needs to be noted that, that um, the Jewish idea of a, of a monotheistic, you know, religion, um, you know, that, that there is one God, it definitely um, is largely unique. Um, most other things have to do with, you know, God being in everything or, 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 you know, there being a whole bunch of different gods and stuff, but you don't see that model with the Bible. Um, another thing is the gods tended to have apathy toward man. Um, and they kind of almost disdained them. They were really only for their pleasure or amusement or, you know, uh, to provide for them or whatever. Um, so that they wouldn't have to do it themselves. But in 2, 15 through 18, the, the Genesis says, uh, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day that you eat from it you will surely die. And then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. So first off, you have God giving man something to do. You, you know, uh, regardless of spiritual, you know, however you want to go with that spiritually, you know, that God did, God created this person and then gave him somewhere to live, some, something to do. He gave him a, he, a, a, a helper, it says, or, you know, would, would later become a wife.
wife, the woman. Um, he he get, he you know it's, it shows it constantly shows God putting this uh, care into creation. And we just read through Genesis and the rest of the Old Testament. Don't think twice. But in its context, this was very important. Especially it seems how like I said, the gods tended to have apathy toward men. So also, uh, the gods la uh, had a very serious lack of higher character. They would act however you would anticipate them to act, you know what I mean? Uh, they, they wouldn't ever do anything unexpected. I mean, what would you do in that situation? Well, that's what the gods would do, too. Um, if you would lie, they would lie. So, you know what I mean, it, 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 in the way that the gods think, it's never anything above or separate from man's logic. Um, and it does stand to reason that if, you know, if there is a god, that he would he would have to be, I mean, at least to some extent, more knowledgeable and understand things differently than people. I think of think of what psychology, not psychology, philosophy shows us. There is there is no such thing as being unbiased. You always carry your bias, your personal agenda with you, your environment, what who made what made you who you are. You cannot possibly objectively look at life. You're going to look at it with some kind of a worldview. And so it stands to reason that, that, that God would have to be void of these things because he wouldn't have had a creation. He would have been an eternal, uh, non-material, you know, being. Um, so, I'm getting a little bit off topic. This isn't a theology course. Um, also, uh, a lot of times, you know, different views with humanity having the answers or not having the answers. But look what 3.7 says. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. They were even unaware that they were naked. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. So that God's caring for them, and the whole time they're completely unaware that they're naked. And then they sin, and they're like, oh, we're naked. Um, and it just has this whole different spin on, on does humanity have all the answers? Um, and also there's the issue of the disunity among the gods, that they were always quarreling together. But as I mentioned before, with, with Genesis, that's completely void. God obviously isn't arguing amongst himself. Um, but one thing that's important as we study through the Old Testament is to remember that it doesn't try to prove God. It just kind of assumes that he is. And it also does not give us a modern a, a question and answer that, that conforms to modern expectations. Okay, um, it, it is an ancient book. We need to remember that when we're looking at it. It's not something that you can just simply go to and find every question to everything you have, every, every answer to every question you have. Oh, well, did this happen? Did this happen? Well, the Bible doesn't say that, you know. And a lot of times, we'll, people try to force the Bible to say something that it never intended to say. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, here in a minute. Um, so about creation, um, it's important to note that, that um, the the Christian doctrine ex what is it ex nihilo um, created from nothing um, that that is very much so seems to be affirmed here. If not here, then in other parts of Scripture as well. I know some people like to quarrel over what the wording here means, but um, stay on target here. And, and uh, comparing it to other Scripture, it makes it abundantly clear that it is from nothing. Um, it, also, the days of, of creation correspond with one another. Uh, what happens in, in four is fulfilled in, in day four. I'm sorry, what happens in day one is fulfilled in day four. What happens in day two is, is fulfilled in day five. And what happens in day three is fulfilled in day six. Um, so there's just definitely this, this overlap. Um, also, uh, man is said to have been created from dust and given breath, made in the image of God. Um, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, it's important to note that God does not have a, a physical body. John mentions this. It's not like he has, you know, private parts. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, when Jesus came to earth, he was fully a man. But, you know, it's important to establish that distinction. Um, so when he says in his image, you know, he's talking about a lot of other things that are outside of the scope of this course, but he's not necessarily talking his physical, you know, likeness. So, um, and then 2.7 says, mm. Then the Lord God formed man of dust, from the, <clears throat> of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So, uh, in that aspect, man is definitely unique. It's the only creation that is mentioned of this. It's also important to note that contrary to what Gnosticism teaches, um, the creation was said to be good. 
Um, and, and, and after each of the different things, it says that the Lord saw and said that it was good. You know, um, so I think that's that's worth noting. Um, God didn't create anything evil. He created free will, but he didn't create evil. Um, so in the er Eridu Genesis, um, it just has some very interesting, um, I guess you could say, contrast with the book of Genesis. Um, and this is what it says. Uh, once again, a reading out of the Readings from the Ancient Near East. I highly recommend the Encountering Biblical Studies uh, series. Just highly, highly recommend. It's by Baker Books. It's just great. Um, Nintur was paying attention. Let me bethink myself of the humankind, all forgotten as they are. And mindful of mine, Nintur's creation, creatures, let me bring them back. Let me lead the people back from their trails. May they come and build cities and cult places, that I may cool myself in their shade. Are you, are you not understanding what he says? First off, in the Bible, you know, they're tearing down the cult places. Whereas in this, they're, the gods wanted them to build it up. Um, also, uh, them building it, it caused the uh, caused the god to experience pleasure in the shade. Um, also, um, um, whereas Genesis, God tells the people to spread out. Here, this god Ninter is telling them to uh, to come and build cities. Um, just interesting. Uh, may they lay the bricks for the cult cities in pure spots, and may they found places for damnation in pure spots. She gave direction. Oh, there's another thing: is in Genesis, the you know the patriarchs, for instance, would go and they would make an altar somewhere and make somewhere pure. Whereas this, it's more seeming to imply that they were places that were pure that they were to build the high places at or the cult cult places at. She gave directions for purification, cries for clemency, the things that cool divine wrath, perfected the divine service and the august offices. Said to the surrounding regions, let me institute peace there. When Anne, Enlil, Inki, and Ninhar Saga fashioned the dark-headed people, they had made the small animals that came up from out of the earth, come from the earth in abundance, and had let there be, as befits it, gazelles, wild donkeys, and four-footed beasts in the desert. So you can definitely see the, the, the different flow in the Eridu Genesis as there is in the Genesis account. Uh, and then again in the Memphis creation story, um, it gives a very interesting... Uh, a dialogue, I guess you could say, well not dialogue, uh, a story account, I guess you could say, um, of, of how the two, the two gods, uh, um, Seth and Horus, I believe, um, and, and, and how there's this, this tension between them. The Ennead gathered themselves to him, and he judged Horus and Seth. He prevented them from quarreling further, and he made Seth the king of Upper Egypt in the land of Upper Egypt at the place where he was born. Uh, Sue. Now, uh, it's important to note that Upper Egypt is actually Southern Egypt, and Lower Egypt is actually Northern Egypt. I hope I said that right. Um, then Geb made Horus, and the reason why is because of the flow of the Nile. Um, then Geb made Horus the king of Lower Egypt in the land of Lower Egypt at the place where his father was drowned, Peshet Taweh. Thus Horus stood in one place, and Seth stood in another uh, place. They were reconciled about the two lands. Words spoken by Geb to Seth, go to the place in which you were born, Seth, Upper Egypt. Words spoken by Geb to Horus, go to the place in which your father was drowned, Horus, Lower Egypt. Once again, this god, Horus, has, has a father who was drowned. Words spoken by Geb to Horus and Seth, I have judged you, Lower and Upper Egypt. But then it became ill in the heart of Geb that the portion of Horus was only equal to the portion of Seth. So Ge Geb gave his entire inheritance to Horus, that is the son of his son, his firstborn. Th thus Horus stood over the entire land. Um, once again, the image of firstborn is not unique to the Bible as well. Um, and we may talk about this some other time, but God using that imagery to, to teach something. Thus this land was united, proclaimed with the great name Tatenen, south of his wall, um, south of his wall, the Lord of Eternity. The two great sor sorceresses grew up on his head, so it was that uh, Horus appeared as king of Upper and Lower Egypt, who united the two lands in Wall Nome, in the place of which the two lands are united. So talking about how the two places are, are the, the, the north and the south is reconciled to, to each other. It happened that Reed and Papyrus were set at the great double door of the house of Ta. That means Horus and Seth, who were reconciled and united, so that they associated and their quarreling ceased in the place that they reached. Being joined in the house of Ta, the balance of the two lands in which um, Upper and Lower Egypt have been weighed. Just interesting, uh, the 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 distinction there. Um, another thing is man is unable to fix the wrong that he's done in Genesis, whereas in the in the other accounts, you know, sometimes the, god, the gods are able to, you know, talk to the people and, and they're able to do these things and everything's all okay, you know. 
Um, the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you. And he goes to the curses of him. Then he goes to Adam and says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed of the ground because of you. And he talks about uh, the labor. And then he goes down to the woman uh, in... Um, Where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, in verse 16. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you. Um, so, <clears throat> they are unable to fix the situation. Um, it's, it, it is interesting that God chose to punish them, but not kill them. Interesting. Um, I just noticed that one time when I was reading, and it just kind of stuck out to me. Um, so there were obviously immediate and far-reaching consequences from, from their rebellion, from their sin. Um, the first is is obviously spiritual death. They, there was a separation between them and God um, as they realized that they had been naked and that kind of stuff. Um, there was, there was, then also there was, um, there was birth pains for women, um, or at least greater birth pains. It's a little bit unclear as to whether it's something from when there wasn't any or just an increase of that bad thing. Um, it's well, um, and then also man is man is now uh, forced to do labor, um, forced to work all of his days. Um, but then there's also far-reaching consequences, and I'm obviously not listing all the consequences of the rebellion. There there were others. I'm not going to deny that, but these are the ones that I thought were most important. Um, the decay in the world started to happen. Things started to to fall apart. Uh, um, death uh, as a result. People and things now die. Um, sickness spreads, uh, and that kind of idea. So then, after all this, they, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden, the, the land of paradise that God gave to them. And they have these two kids, Cain and Abel. Now, they bo both Cain and Abel offer sacrifices to God, yet Abel's is accepted and Cain's is rejected. Now, a lot of people have given different um, reasons as to why that happens. The most obvious answer seems to be that Cain simply had wrong motives when he offered his sacrifice, and as a result, the Lord didn't receive it. That seems to be what's going on. Now, obviously, a lot of people make this super spiritual and draw away all kinds of stuff out of there rather than just learning what the, le the principle was. Um, and uh, remember, everything is written for a reason, so just try to understand what the writer is trying to tell you what he's trying to teach you um, and then we see in chapter 4 uh, verse 23 that man starts deciding what is right and what is wrong Elamech said to his wives Adam and Zillah listen to my voice you wives of Lamech give heed to my speech for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me if Cain is avenged sevenfold then Lamech seventy sevenfold so just this idea of, of, of um, people deciding right and wrong they don't really start they just kind of start writing God off uh, even as they they keep um, they keep uh, spreading out. So Cain kills Abel. Um, a good way to remember that is Cain killed Abel with a cane. So regardless of whether they actually killed him with a cane or not, you know it's just a, a nice little device to help you remember. Um, but anyways, and so man starts to spread out, and uh, eventually Adam and Eve uh, have another son, Seth. Uh, kind of funny how we just read about Seth with the Egyptian account. And, um, anyways, and 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 they, they, um, they you know they, the humanity spreads off, um, but then as as the course of them them going, it seems like they just kind of distance and time and, and and whatnot and just cause them to forget where they came from, and so they start just making stuff up and 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 start living however they see fit. And as a result, God shortens their lifespan. And 6.3, uh, Genesis says that, um, Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. And then again, and I believe the Psalms, uh, it mentions that man's years are 70, I think. So you can see, you know, man's years uh, going down. Um, whereas, you know, um, not, the Bible isn't the only book to claim that people used to live a long time. I mean, there, that's kind of a resounding theme in, in the myths of the ancient Near East, so, which is one of the reasons why the Old Testament is seen as, as not reliable. Um, 
And then in verses 11 through 12, um, Now the man was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all the flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Um, so definitely they had scarred their conscience. And so that takes us eventually to the flood in chapter 7. Now, people have formulated all kinds of different ideas. It seems most likely that the flood was sometime before 10,000 B.C. So people then ask, well, what if you add up the dates? Once again, the Old Testament is not supposed to, especially Genesis, is not supposed to be just this, this history book for no no reason or purpose. Um, genealogies would often skip skip different people to emphasize those people that were important for the author to, to emphasize. Um, so, you know, we can't go to this, once again, wanting to, to answer our questions. Oh, well, how, how long has it been? That kind of stuff. Um, when when it, doesn't, it doesn't claim that, you know, and so we need to be careful. Um, now, the rainbow is given after the flood from, from God to say that, you know, hey, I'm not going to do this again. And uh, I'm actually going to read that. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast on the earth and on every bird of the sky, with everything that creeps on the ground and all, and, and all the flesh of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life that is its blood. See, once again, man was created, it seemed, Genesis records that man was created as vegetarians. Um, and then after the flood, and then again later, um, man's given man's given meat. And we'll talk more about this in future lessons. But surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast. I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply, populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you. And with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, then every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off uh, by the water of the flood. Now they shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. So it seems, given the context, that this was a global flood. And you can keep reading there through verse 16, but I think you get the main point here. Um, and that it was it was a global flood. A flood, as he says, I will never again flood the whole earth, and that area has been flooded since, and other areas of the world have been flood, flooded since. So it just kind of says, okay, so either it's a local flood and God lied, or it was a global flood, and uh, it just happened before everybody thinks it happened. Once again, it could have very easily happened before 10,000 BC, but yet for some reason Christians, you know, hold this view of a extremely young Earth, and it's like, well, that really wasn't taught in the Bible anywhere. It never gives references to how old, old the earth is. You know, why don't don't affirm something that the Bible doesn't teach. Because then you're going to be arguing with people in the world and making yourself look stupid for no reason. Um, at least, you know, uh, people say, well, oh, it was all the inhabited world. Well, it doesn't seem likely, but I guess that, that is possible as long as the inhabited world was a good span of, of space. Um, also, the flood is attested by most cultures. Um, most cultures do have their own accounts of a, of a big flood happening. And when there's that many different people from different backgrounds affirming something, it's worth seeing the possibility of it actually happening. Let me just leave that at that. Um, as far as what some people say, where is the ark? Well, that was a long time ago, and it was made out of wood, so I would imagine it did what all wood does over time. And, you know, it's gone. <laughs> that would be my assumption. Once again, uh, demanding something that, that is kind of a little bit silly. Um, <clears throat> in the Epic of Atracasus, um, it says this, 1,200 years had not yet passed when the land extended and the people multiplied. The land was bellowing like a bull, the god goat um, disturbed with their uproar. And they heard their noise and addressed the great gods. The noise of humankind has become too intense for me with their uproar. I am deprived of sleep. Let there be plague. So, obviously, it, continu it continues going, but it's this idea of man just inconveniencing the gods, and they can't sleep. Um, and so they have this idea of, of, of destroying, and then they regret destroying, and they're just... You just, just the, the gods don't have this higher character that is that is um, obvious of, of Yahweh. Um and we'll talk more about that in a second. So, so then it takes us to the Tower of Babel in chapter 11, um, where language is separated. Um, let me see here. Um, where language is separated um, in chapter 11. 
And uh, it, it, it's important to note that, remember I was talking about chiasm, how it starts and ends, and it come, kind of goes like this. Um, the Tower of Babel is a chiasm. Now the whole earth use, used is how it begins. The whole earth, that's how it ends. Confuse the language of the whole earth uh, is how it ends. Same language and the same words. And um, verse 2, um, in, the, in the land of Shinar, yet it ends in the land of Babel. It starts, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And, and then it ends, come, let us go down in there, confuse their language. Um, so you can see the resounding themes. Come, let us, come, let us. It happened in Shinar, happened in Babel. Happened in the whole earth, the whole earth. See what I mean? It just has that, that structure. And so what is the main what is the main focus? The main fo focus is the Lord came down. It happens in verse 5. It's the only it's the only part of all the verses that doesn't have a parallel uh, before and after. So um, the main point is that the Lord came down and, and it saw. So uh, this is this is the start of Babylon. Babylon becomes, in a way, a symbol of evil. Um, it becomes a symbol of rebellion. Um, and so um, I'll, I'll read this too. It's called... Um, uh, and Merker and the Lord of Ara Arata. Um, uh, then Ada, the Lord, Ada the Prince, Ada the King. Enki, Ada the Lord, Ada the Prince, Ada the King. goes on like this. Um, the Lord of Abundance, whose commands are trustworthy, the Lord of Wisdom. Um, once upon a time there was no snake. Sorry, I... I uh, I read the wrong note. Once upon a time, there was no stake, there was no scorpion, there was no hyena. It goes on like this. In those days, the lands, the lands of Shunbar and Hamadzi, Harmony Tung Sumer, the great land of the decrees of prince, princeship, Yuri, the land having all that is appropriate, land Martu, and then it goes on and says, um, Endowed with wisdom, the Lord of Iridu changed the speech in their mouths, brought contention into it, into the speech of man that until then had been one. So, uh, other, you know, there are other accounts of. of the uh, the gods at least um, splitting up their language, you know, and and when there's this many people, I, either they were all copying each other, which in many cases seems very unlikely, or they are recording this the same event. Um, so you see, man's sin eventually leads them to a corruption of the idea of who God is, whereas once they walked with God, now they're 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 you know throughout the period of time they get more and more confused of who God really is, and as a result, I believe. Uh, a little vague on this. It's possible that maybe demons had an influence on this, but either way, they start creating um, ideas of, of of who God is, and then start start saying that there's multiple gods. And you know, the Bible says about how demons uh, or false doctrines originate with demons. And you know, um, it may apply to this, maybe. So the setting there is is God is sovereign, and but then you have this problem. Man is guarded from the evil. You see God in control, and you see all man. Uh, uh, not you know evil basically, and then you see one family um, come from all that. Just these different these different forms. Um, so that brings up the, that brings up the question of evolution. Did evolution happen? If it did, um, God was still the one in control of it. So it was a theistic evolution. However, once again, the Bible doesn't really specify, and all that we need to affirm is what the Bible affirms. And the Bible affirms that man. Man did not did not evolve from something else. He was formed from the dust of the earth. However, that does not mean that, that God did not use the evolution on any of the other creatures, just that he did not use it on man. So as far as science, do we have to fear it as Christians? No. We don't have to be afraid of science. Uh, we can actually learn a lot from science. In fact, many times us as Christians are ignorant of things that we don't have to be. You know, we shouldn't be afraid of science. Um, it's not like something's going to be found that will disprove the Bible or anything. So by all means, seek after science. Just don't let every little thing that seems like an error, and, and you know what I mean, don't let it always um, let, lead you to disbelief. Just hold in there and look for an answer. You know, sometimes answers are years off. Um, and then also sometimes we affirm things from the Bible, and then science comes by and disproves it, and we think that it's disproving the Bible when it's actually only disproving our view of the Bible. So once again, be a little bit flexible when you're studying the Old Testament. Um, it talks about the the origin of evil it comes from when 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 people and angels decide um, rather than listening to God um, they they make the choice of evil that they choose um, and so the evil comes from that choice it's it's a, it's an off branch of that um, 
so sin produces death and God's wrath. This obviously leaves a problem that humanity can't resolve, which is the rest of the story of the Bible. You know, it's all laid out in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. Um, also, it's important to note human sexuality. Um, it's not something to fear from. We'll get more into this later, but that definitely is a factor. Um, you know, God did create us to have sex for pleasure. He created us to have sex for reprodu reproduction. He, you know, um, it does, you know, relax people. It does, you know, help them feel closer to each other. Just because something is misused in culture does not mean that it should be abandoned in Christianity. Once again, Christianity is not about extremism. It's about a balance. Okay? Oftentimes, um, Christianity is about finding that balance. So that will take us to, to Job. Uh, that's where we'll pick up next week. Um, or I should say next lesson, whenever, whenever that is. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you learned something from it. We'll continue talking about Job and, and, and the rest of Genesis later. Um, why I broke it up like this is because Genesis 1 through 11 is more uh, prehistory, and 12 and onward is more, you know, comes into the dates of, of understand, you know, the dates that we actually know more about. And it goes from more broad coverage to more specific spans, and then eventually gets down to like kings, for instance. First and saying Kings, where it actually gives us good dates on stuff. Um, so, uh, so keep studying. Um, there will never be anything that completely disproves the Bible, although there may be some things that seem to disprove uh, parts of the Bible. So, if you just stick it out, um, answers are always around the corner. Um, okay.